My title is Serve the Master's Interests. How many of you understand that the, uh, the master's interest is more important than yours, but at the other side of it, your interest is in his interest? It's hard to imagine that your outcome is in his interest, but it is because he, he delights himself in all of us and he takes pleasure in all of us. You know that. I mean, he loves you. He tracks you down all the time. And sometimes it's hard to believe. I didn't know that because we all struggle with this area. It's hard to believe that if I lose my identity to find my identity in him, if I lose my own ambition to chase his ambition, that I really do end up where I want to be. So what it, with this, this title of this message, Serving the Master's Interest, is really about who is the great king in your life. It's a struggle that we all have. Because, my God, come on, let's all admit it. There's sometimes I just like being in charge. <laughs> I'm the only one I'm, I can see. All right. All right. Everybody's all right. You like being in charge. But it's much more profitable when he's in charge. You know why? Because when he's in charge, he graces you to accomplish what he wants you to do. And then you find yourself in this happy place. So let's talk about serving the, the master's interests. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 11 says this. When you walk in wisdom, and I want you to take note of, it's when you and I walk in wisdom, Jesus says, my heart is filled with gladness for the way you live is proof that what I've taught you is not in vain. So now we see that walking with Jesus and walking in wisdom is about a teaching moment. It's just not getting revelation from heaven and having the whole pie at one moment. It's like you get little nuggets, you get little bits, you get little pieces about walking with Jesus. And as you walk with him, he teaches you. And the more you follow his ways, your life is transformed. That's the whole, the whole concept of 2020 is that there is a, there's this anointing, I believe, for transformation. So wherever you are right now, will not be where you are at the end of this year, nor at the end of this decade, because we just entered into a new decade. So we're believing that the 20s will be the, year, the, the decade of the roaring 20s of the glory of God. Amen. In the past, it was the roaring 20s of some really questionable things. The heart of America was in a different place. We're, we're believing God that in the 20s, God is recapturing the heart of America. Amen. It'll be the year, the decade of the 20s. But I want you to take note of the word teach. He says, I, I, I've taught you. And what I teach you is not to be in vain. The, ter the word teach there or taught means to instruct you, to inform you, to communicate knowledge of something that you're presently ignorant of. Now, it doesn't mean that that puts you at a, you know, that calls you a dummy or stupid. It just means you have no knowledge of a higher level of living. Aren't you glad that there's a higher level of living than the one you're presently on? That means there's something to chase after. In Isaiah chapter 2, we find this, that he says that he will teach us of his ways. So he says right here, I'm going to teach you, but my teachings are not to be in vain in any of your lives because he teaches us his ways and he wants us to walk in his ways. So the whole purpose of teaching is so that we can learn how to do things his way. Everybody say his way. Yes. Now, to, in order to do it his way, you have to embrace the fact that you're going to have to learn. That means you're going to have to be taught. That means there are things you're going to have to readjust. We talked about this last week about just automobile driving. Driving is a constant adjustment. It's always, you're always adjusting your speed. Sometimes you're braking. Sometimes you're turning right, left, putting on, you know, your blinkers, your hazards, whatever's necessary, but you're always making adjustments. That's how it is in the presence of God. But in the presence of God, it's always to your good, but you're always moving forward. Now, in life, there are times that you may have to slow down, stop, recalculate, get your bearing again, and start again. But how many of you understand that more often in life, if you think about your automobile, you are moving forward far more than you are ever going in reverse? Amen. So I want to just really encourage you today 
to serve the master's interests. And as you do that, he's promised your life will be honored with sweet things. When you put him in charge. Now let me give you kind of... Um, we're going to talk about the, the training and perspective side of life. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 20 through verse 23. This, this parable that Jesus teaches is about a prince. And it's about a prince and his servants. And this prince is going to travel into a distant land where he's soon to be crowned king over that territory, but he has to leave. And in his leaving, he entrusts to each of his servants $50,000. And I want you to take note of, he gives them money to trade with and also to invest. How many of you know that your life is something where he puts Jesus, Father God puts this great value on the inside of you. He gives you Christ, the anointed one, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. In other words, you get all the promises of God, you get the teacher of the universe living on the inside of you, and at that moment, let's say he's worth, which we know he's, he's beyond measure of what he's valued, but it's a deposit of $50,000. And here's what he tells you in your life. You take the investment that I've entrusted you with. I've entrusted you with Jesus. I've entrusted you with the promises of God. I've entrusted you with the Holy Spirit of God. Now work the system. Trade with the system and invest with the system. In other words, there's going to be an exchange. You give into the system, you get from the system. You trade with the system, and then with the measure that you get, you invest it into life. Does that make sense? So you've been entrusted by God with a system. Now work the system. Well, we know the story that one of the the, the, the uh, entrusted ones, ten times more. He took his investment ten times above what was expected. And the end result was, Jesus says, you've been faithful in a little. So Jesus is saying, the investment that I put in you was just a seed. <laughs> it was a seed of trust. But you increased it 10 times over, so now I'm not just going to give you money, now I'm giving you cities. You see, the training aspect of things is that we think that we're only been entrusted to money, but money is just the, the stepping stone to cities and greater things. And that's why he says, if, if, and I hate to, because we just got our offering, but if you can't be found faithful with a little, who's going to entrust you with anything more than that? Because true riches are connected to the generous heart. So this guy got out of there courageously and he started investing. The second guy came in, the investment turned over five times more. And guess what he got? Five cities. He increased, one increased ten, one increased five. Both of them were relevant in the increase of what was yet to come. But there was one, had a whole different perspective. He wasn't too sure about serving the master's interests because he was really afraid of his own interests. So we want to talk about that. How many of you know that everybody got the same instructions? Yep. But everybody can see the instructions from different backgrounds based upon your own inner world. So when you're coming into this form of instruction, teaching, remember Jesus says, I celebrate over the fact that you live well because of my teachings. You didn't take them in vain. I celebrate with you. But not everybody receives revelation and insight the same based upon family life, the way you were brought up, the way you think about yourself, the conversations that you have on the inside about yourself dictates a lot. You sense the presence of God saying go right, but you're afraid to go right because you only know left. And so you make up what you want, and individually you become your own God. Now, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying it's a struggle we all have. We all have that struggle. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Let's look at this. So Jesus then comes. Another comes before Jesus, the king, and he says, Master, here is the money 
You've entrusted to me. I hid it for safekeeping. Well, you think, well, that's pretty good. But that's not what the instruction said. The instruction says, I've empowered you to bear fruit. I've empowered you to increase in life. I've empowered you to shine like a city on a hillside. I've given you me. And this dude says, no, I'm afraid of you, so I'm going to hide it. So here's his reasoning, or here's the imagination on the inside. He says, you see, I live in fear of you. Now that doesn't mean reverence, that means I'm afraid. I'm afraid to step out by faith. I'm afraid to, to really adjust my life according to your standards. For everyone knows that you're a strict master and impossible to please. But how many of you know that that statement, impossible to please and a strict master, is really not, it's not true. But it's an imagination that's on the inside of him because he's struggling with something on the inside of his own life that he's seeing the instructions that two people can take and make it ten times more valuable or five times more valuable. He takes the same instructions and is offended by those instructions and he hides it. Because he's afraid. And he feels like the master is strict because he wants more from him than he thinks that he's capable of doing. But the fact of the matter is, with the promise comes the grace to do what he's asking you to do. And at the end of the day, when you, when you accomplish what he's asked you to do, you really didn't do it anyway because it was the grace on the promise that enabled you to do what he wanted you to do. So really, you don't do nothing except have faith in God. <laughs> Somebody says, Pastor, how did y'all build all this and, and, and do it debt free? I don't know. I really don't know. Just showed up every day. Believe God. Amen. Took the little bit of money we had, spent it in the building, and more came. <laughs> I don't know. There was no solution except trust God. Invest in what I had, a dream, a seed, a promise. All right, everybody getting it? But he says, you're impossible to please, which we know is not true because we just read a scripture that says, when I walk in his wisdom, his heart is filled with gladness because of the way we live and that it's a proof that what he taught me is not in vain. So he does take pleasure. It's not impossible to please him. He, so he says, you push us for a higher return. Isn't that wonderful? That Jesus doesn't allow you to stay stagnant there's always a push. There's always a push. You can do more. I can't do no more. Sure you can. It's in you. You got it. You say, I don't have it. Yes, you do, because I'm in you. Amen. It's always the push. It's always his presence. Go to the next level. Trust me. Believe me. Come on. You can get out on the water. You can do the impossible. I can't do the impossible. You're just too hard on me. Not ever realizing that your destiny is in the push. You push us for higher returns on all that you own. <laughs> How many of you know you are owned by the Lord? So there's a push. And I know that in the midst of the push, there's a lot of correction. Stop thinking this way. Quit talking that way. Get out of that relationship. Block them. <laughs> but I don't want to. Then deal with the trouble. <laughs> I'm picking on Missy. She's laughing over there. We've had a situation in our little thing. And I said, Missy, block it. But Missy's so compassionate and so loving. She just, she deals with it. And it works out well. It worked out well. Really did. But at some point, you know, in life, it takes courage to block. It takes courage to say, I choose Jesus. I really wasn't picking on him. It was a great illustration. All right. So he goes on to say, you always want Gain from someone else's efforts. And the king says, You wicked servant, 
Now, when we take the word wicked servant, we can just leave it like that, just you're a wicked servant, that means you're evil. But how many of you know the word wicked is the, it really, it's the root word of wicker, and it's a twisted mindset. So what he could be saying then is that your, your actions are wicked because they're twisted. And so he says, so the Lord says, so I'm going to use your own words to judge you. If what you said about me is true, now look at that, if what you said about me is true, because it was all in the imagination. It was all the inner world that was working on the inside of this person. That I'm a harsh man pushing you for even higher returns and wanting gain from others' efforts. If that's the truth, he's going to put the responsibility right back on the, on the servant. Why didn't you at least put my money in the bank and earn interest that I entrusted to you? Why didn't you do the bare minimum? Why not, why not just the bare minimum? So how many of you understand that no commandment from the Lord is ever to put you in bondage? No instruction, no correction. None of it is about putting anybody into bondage. So what we're called to do is to surrender self-ambition. Surrendering self-ambition is really surrendering self-centered passions. Now listen, there's some things that I think in life are very good to be passionate about. You know, being in love with my bride and, and being passionate for her and my girls, I think, is what God wants. Being passionate for you as a people, as my family and the spirit, I think that's cool. That's all wonderful. But how many of you know people can be passionate about anger? Driven by it, driven by anger, driven by lust, driven by so many evil forces that you actually can be passionate about it. And so when he says right here, surrender self-ambitions, it's really to identify what's the driving force in my life. How many of you know fear can be a passion? It's an evil passion. You say, well, I'm not passionate about fear. I hate fear. But you're driven by it all the time. So you have to surrender that unto the Lord. And so when, when we look at the term correction or God making these adjustments in our life, it's a call for higher return. It's just really based upon how do you see this? Because the potential of all of our lives is to produce higher returns. But we look at correction as a super negative. So when Jesus is calling for the higher return, he's really addressing the issues of the heart. He's asking you about your heart. Like, what's the passion? What's the drive? I want you to look at you because with you and me, and listen, I, sh I, wanna, I want you to know this. You remember we talked about the heart can be reflected as your thought life. It can be reflected as um, your, your will. But it's also your, your heart could be a part of your discernment. How many of you understand that unless you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you to discern your own heart, you just don't get it? Man, we need greater, I, I, well, I don't want to say we, I'm just going to say me, greater levels of discernment in me. You know, sometimes we think that the spirit of discernment is about me discerning what's going on in somebody else's life. My God, what the heck I need to discern somebody else's life with and I got my own life that needs adjustment. <laughs> I'm going to point my finger over there when I got a thumb and four uh, fingers pointing back at me. Everything's pointing back at me. Dude, discern your own heart, knucklehead. But I do want to say this, that I do think that the call for higher return is always to lead you to the fullness of oneness with him. In other words, he's trying to adjust the measures of our hearts so we become more like him and walk greater in a greater level of intimacy with him. So correction then is really just an invitation to your divine destiny. And this is what we're dealing with. How can we ever be transformed if there's never a level of correction? It's just a great question. I'm not trying to like harbor and just stay on this level of correction, but it is something that's so valuable because if you don't guard the heart and know why your heart issues out what it does, you can never correct it. You can never go before Jesus and say, Jesus, I've been dealing with this mindset all of my life and it started back there. 
I want to repent of back there. Because listen, people can insult you, abuse you, misuse you. But at the end of the day, you develop the mindset. You develop the protective mechanism. And at some point in your life, you can change it to embrace a new system. Amen. Keep on preaching, Pastor. That is so awesome. But it's difficult, isn't it? Because I like being me. I've become comfortable being me. It doesn't matter if I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. I like being me because it's easy. But with correction, I can change me. And I can change my destiny. And listen, it's not that difficult. Come on, the Holy Ghost doesn't make anything difficult. It just takes courage to invest in you. Remember we talked about a couple weeks ago that the greatest thing that you can do for you is to add leadership for your own life. At some point in your life, if you want to lose weight, you got to look at yourself and say, body, I'm going to lead you from now on. Shut up. I'm not fulfilling that craving. But that's hard. Yeah. You're addicted to sugar. You're like a crack addict. You need deliverance off of sugar. Say, so how you know? Because you saw that pan of muffins back there? I brought them over here so that somebody else could eat them for me because I could eat every one of them. <laughs> All this correction stuff is ultimately about lordship. Who's in charge? Right. So let's look at the next portion of the scripture. We're going to look at Luke 19, verse 24 through 26, where it says, So the king said to the other servants, Take the money that was given to him, and give it to the faithful servant. <laughs> How many of you know right now, you want to be the faithful servants? See, this is where wealth transfer takes place. <laughs> it is removed from the unfaithful and given to the faithful. Give it to the faithful servant who multiplied my money my money, ten times over. But there's always a crowd who will say this, and normally the crowd is in you. Because you will disqualify yourself from God's blessing with this mindset. But master, why give it to him? He already has so much. I don't need no more. Just give it to somebody else, Jesus. Well, no, you qualified for it so that you could be a better return on his money, yeah. on his kingdom, on his resources. He needs somebody faithful with his stuff. Amen. How many of you know because of persecution on the inside of yourself, you will reject greater blessings from heaven because you don't qualify? Now, we do know that there's an external persecution, too. I can't understand why they always get all the good stuff. I can't understand why the blessings always show up in them. They always get the pay raises. They always get this. They always get that. They always on top. They're never on the bottom. Why them? Why them? Why them? Why them? And the truth of the matter is Jesus answered. He says, faithful. How many of you know, and all of them could get as mad as they wanted, but the faithful ones still got the more. Verse 26, he already has so much. Yes, replied the king, but to all who have been faithful, even more will be given to them. Now, he just didn't specifically now talk about that one faithful. He says to all, to all that are faithful, to all that are faithful, more will be given to them. And for the ones who have nothing, how many of you know that's the unfaithful one? Even the little they seem to have will be taken from them. Ouch. That ain't fair. I didn't set the system up. It is fair. He made the system. And he said this is the way the system works in the kingdom of God. It's all based upon faithfulness. 
is based upon you doing what you're supposed to do with the little stuff that you have, being faithful before God. Because, listen, you remember Jesus made a reference to this in the scripture where he says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and you give to God what is God. That means God has a part. Uh, it's tax season. You're going to pay Uncle Sam. Would you, would you have to pay him? They're going to get their money one way or the other. And God has a portion of that too. Now we're not talking about money. I want to get beyond money. We're talking about life. The treasure of life. What are you doing with Jesus in you? So Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, Live in obedient devotion to God. Live. Make life around you obedient in devotion to the great king. If you do that, life's blessings drench the honest and the faithful person. That's what the word says. Life's blessings will drench the honest and faithful. Didn't we just read that? Well, apparently this is not a shout hallelujah message today. I thought it could be. <laughs> it very well couldn't be. But when we're digging deep on the inside and we're having to investigate our inner world, this is not about, like, putting someone down or criticizing. Heck, we don't. I mean, we try to build a family. You know? The only way that I know how to instruct my children through the time that I've had with my girls is we show them two paths. Here's a path of righteousness and a path of unrighteousness. Which one you choose? Whatever one you choose will be the outcome of your life, unless you make an adjustment if you choose the dark. How many of you know you can choose the dark and repent and get back in track? Thank God. But, if, but there's, always, there's always something that comes with death. And the biggest thing that the Word says that comes with death and destruction is a seared consciousness, a dark consciousness, that if you don't know how to redeem that thing by the blood of Jesus, that, de that death consciousness will harass you every day of your life. You don't deserve this. I don't care how much they want to give you. You, have, you don't qualify for that. Don't you remember? You're supposed to say no. It's in the blood. Amen. Amen. No, it's in the blood. Or if you're wondering, like, what do I mean by that? Well, the blood of Jesus was shed for you to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All right, so let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Everybody still okay with me today? All right, I still got a couple minutes left to antagonize you a little bit more. <laughs> To push, to demand, to expect higher return for all of us. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask you a question, and then we're going to finish up. If, if I had, a, like, insider knowledge of where to invest money, where you could make ten times more right now on your money, if I gave you the secret, how many of you take it up? Well, you'd be silly if you didn't. You know what I'm saying? You'd be silly if you didn't. But that's what Jesus is doing right here. This is what Jesus is doing right here. I'm giving you a measure to get 10 times more of an increase out of your life, which would then give you the ability to now govern 10 cities, not $50,000. I mean, what, the outcome of what we're, what we're talking about is far grander than what you start with. But what we're starting with is that this image, like, I can't do that. You're too tough on me. You're always demanding return. But he knows that if you qualify, you get the city. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the city was always the outcome. But you got to go through the trying to find out where you are. You can never do it by yourself. You always got to do it with them. So let's make this statement. The tender heart will always be the people who tremble before God. The tender hearted are the people who honestly trust the Lord. And it's the pure that the word of God says will always be rescued from any form of failure. Why is that significant? Remember where we started off at the beginning of this month? Is that we're builders. 2020 is the year of transformation because we're builders. We build families. We build businesses. We build community. We build the kingdom of God. Well, how are we going to become these extravagant builders? We've got to take the correction. We've got to embrace 
the push for more, more. You know, I worked for a company many years ago, and um, we, we, we were young and fledgling, and the owners, and we, so we, we were instructed, we had to like incinerate so much product to get it done. And the moment that we would meet the goal of so many tons per shift, that was never good enough. Is you're gonna get double, and you're gonna push it, and you're gonna learn how to run the system, because the moment that you don't push, you become satisfied and you settle. So the push was always to go to another level, and it was so frustrating, but you know what ended up happening? Every time the push was on, we got greater results. We got more efficient, more effective, we got, we got better time management, we learned how to do it better. In the beginning, we were just learning how to run the system, and then once we learned how to run the system, the push came, and the push, and the pressure, and the pressure, and the pressure, but you know what? We got really good. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 in closing. Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all of your heart, rely on Him to guide you and He will lead you in every decision you make. Amen. Verse 6. Now this is, I think, the key component of, component of the whole thing. Become intimate with Him in whatever you do. Become intimate with him in everything that you're doing. And he, God, the great king, will lead you wherever you go. So here's the final instruction. Don't think for a moment you know it all. <laughs> because none of us do. But the moment you become complacent, satisfied, settled, you're stuck. How many of you have felt like for a while you've been stuck? Stuck. That's why you feel the pressure coming to push. There's a stirring going on. Push. There's a stirring happening. I demand more of you. And it's like if you look at it negative, you're going to go back into your little corner and you're going to crouch down. You're such a mean God to me. You're always pushing on me. And you never realize that the push is to get more out of you because you're able to. Let's stand up.